Hello everyone, my name is Ignacio Martinez and I'm the product manager of the Repsol Healthcare Polyolefin business. Welcome and thank you very, very much for joining this webinar. Today we are going to explain the solutions that Repsol has developed to face one of the challenges of the medical industry. The challenge is finding the right materials that resist the sterilization by radiation. It can either be gamma, e-beam, x-ray. This type of sterilization is being used more and more, and there's no doubt that the pandemic has accelerated this trend due to the lower sterilization cycle times. Today, uh, Repsol's technical experts, along with the technical experts from our colleagues of Ionisos, will explain the different sterilization methods available in the market. They will also explain the root cause behind this uh, degradation phenomenon, and of course, they will uh, explain the solutions that Repsol has developed to uh, avoid the undesired effect of the yellowness and uh, the brittleness. So now it's time for our speakers. Let me introduce them to you. Uh, from Repsol, Lucia Costa and Raquel Hernandez will be participating. Uh, they both work in the Polyolefin Technical Service and Development Department. In their role, Raquel and Lucia are in charge of product development providing technical expertise to customers for all Repsol healthcare products, as well as identifying opportunities to drive growth and create value in the field of medical and pharmaceutical applications. From Ionisos, doc, uh, Dr. Sophie Wiff will be participating today. Sophie is chemistry engineer and PhD in polymers and composites. She began working for Ionisos in 2000 as project manager. Since 2018, Sophie is the R&D leader for all ra the radiation chemistry projects. And she's also a member of the Polyray Association in France. Uh, once all the speakers have been introduced, uh, I let uh, Lucia start her presentation. Thank you very much. We're gonna start off with a brief uh, presentation of our Repsol Healthcare product brand. Uh, so to meet the challenging needs of the healthcare market, our Repsol healthcare product portfolio, which includes polypropylene, polyethylene, and EVA copolymers, offers a dedicated range of polyolefins for, uh, for the healthcare industry. The Repsol healthcare project began in 2010. Uh, Repsol has been a leading supplier of uh, polyolefins in the Iberian Peninsula for over 40 years, primarily for food application and industrial applications. With the increasing population and rising life expectancy, we understood that there was a rising demand for plastics in healthcare applications. Since 2010, Repsol has been working to develop a product portfolio specifically targeted to the pharma and medical industry, adapting its manufacturing facilities, establishing strict production and quality control protocols to meet the strictest requirements according to the industry's good manufacturing practices. In 2016, Repsol launched its Repsol healthcare portfolio. The Repsol Healthcare concept is based on three principles, guarantee, commitment, and service. Through our rigor rigorous protocols and quality control systems, we ensure batch-to-batch -batch consistency and highest quality products. All our products are tested and approved according to US and European pharmacopoeia, as well as USP class six biocompatibility tests. We're fully aware of the complexities and complex validation processes required for medical applications, so we follow a strict non-change uh, control policy. And behind these, these products is a fully dedicated and experienced team of experts from customer service to technical service and development uh, assistance and uh, uh, a dedicated group of, uh, of regulatory experts. Our Repsol healthcare products are manufactured in three production sites. Uh, our full range of polypropylene grades are produced in Tarragona, as well as our high density polyethylene grades and a part of our low density polyethylene products. The other part of our low density polyethylene uh, grades are produced in our Portugal site in Sinus. And finally, our EVA copolymers are produced in Puerto Llano. 
On this slide, uh, you can see our full range of products that we offer. So we offer uh, polypropylenes, homopolymer, random copolymers, and heterophasic copolymers, uh, low density polyethylene grades, high density polyethylene grades, and EVA copolymers. Uh, we have two specific grades, uh, polypropylene grades, that have been designed to resist gamma, E-beam, and X-ray radiation, which are HPR35RMD and HPP55RMD, which are uh, the target of today's webinar, which will be covered in today's presentation. Before we go into uh, uh, specifics of today's webinar, we will be playing a short video of our Repsol Healthcare product brand. Polypropylene is a widely used polymer in the medical industry for the production of sangerites, closures, packets, or pipettes, for example. One of the most important aspects concerning the production of such products is the elimination of by burdens by a sterilization technique, and high, radiation, high energy radiation is a very common one. Uh, conventionally sterilized polypropylenes are not suitable for this type of sterilization because of the shiver and brightenment and discoloration that occurs in the material after the sterilization and which uh, can further deteriorate with time. Repsol, in its commitment for providing valuable solutions to the healthcare sector, has developed two polypropylene grades specifically designed to resist E-beam, gamma, and S-ray radiation. The grade HPP55 RMD is a homopolymer with a very high melt flow rate of 55, intended, for example, for pipe tips or deep boil plates, where fluidity and low retention properties are very important. The grade HPR35 RMD is a random copolymer with a very, very good transparency and for the production of, for example, senior parents. If we look at the effects that radiation has on polymers, we must say that each polymer reacts differently depending on the structure of the polymer. For, exa for example, uh, polymers with uh, cyclic or ring structures um, are resistant to radiation effects. Other polymers uh, with carbon-carbon chains, if the carbon has one or more hydrogen atoms attached, uh, it has been observed that um, cross-linking effects generally occur. Cross-linking reaction forms carbon-carbon uh, new covalent bonds 
uh, between uh, adjustment chains, increasing the polymer molecular weight up to the formation of a three-dimensional network. This is the case, for example, of polyethylene that remains stable up to 70, 80 kilograms. Uh, the use of higher doses produce uh, the starts the um, cross-linking effect and increasing the tensile strength and achieving superior mechanical properties. However, other polymers such as polypropylene are affected by a chain excision mechanism. The hydrogen atoms, here you can see uh, um, with the tertiary carbon, are uh, easily to abstract by the radicals uh, generated by the radiation. This tertiary carbon is unstable in the main chains of the polypropylene is unstable and is uh, divided into polymer uh, parts. Th that results in the breakdown of the molecular weight of the polymer becoming more brittle. This chain excision leads the reduction in mechanical properties especially uh, the tensile strength and the elongation at break. If we focus on polypropylene in detail, apart from the chain excision mechanisms already explained, we must speak about oxidative degradation that occurs in polymers with prone to excisioning uh, when are irradiated in air. The alkyl radicals generated by the radiation immediately react with oxygen to form peroxy radicals. It's important to take into account that with gamma sterilization process, this oxidative degradation is more severe because the process takes longer than with e beam or uh, X-ray radiation. To prevent these oxidative degradations, the stabilization of the polymer plays a very important role. A standard or conventional additive packets usually consists of synergistic combination of um, phenol and phosphate antioxidants. Primary antioxidants, such as phenol base, react with, uh, have the capability to donate uh, hydrogen atoms to the to Kent's free radicals from the oxidative degradation. In case of phosphate or secondary uh, antioxidants, they react with the hydroperoxides to decompose them into non-radical products. However, the high energy sterilization leads to the formation of such amount of reactive radicals that phenolic antioxidants can be overconsumed or overoxidized. The most common products of this overoxidation is ki are quinones that are responsible of the yellowing effect. In the next slides, we are going to look in detail how the polypropylene grays HPP 55 RMD and HPR 35 RMD with its, uh, its appropriate uh, additivation prevent the problem of premature aging and discoloration. In the graphs on the left are represented the tensile mechanical properties of the materials at different radiation dosages. Loss of elongation is the commonly used measure of radiation effects because it equates to a brittleness failure. If we look at the graph, a dose of 50 kilograms is considered a limit for the random copolymer HPR 35 RMD, as the loss of elongation reaches a significant percentage of 25%. However, for the same doses, the standard stabilized polypropylene loses around 55%. In the case of the homopolymer, the dose of 50 kilograms can be used ensuring that the mechanical properties remain unaltered. And with higher doses up to 75 kilograms, the loss of elongation at break, as we can see here, is uh, significantly, uh, can be considered significantly. Nonetheless, viewing the graphs here on the right side, where is plot the elongation at break comparing Repsol radiation resistant grades to the same polymer with a standard additivation, it's shown that the embrightenment of the polymer will be much higher with a standard stabilization polypropylene. Now, my colleague Lucia will continue with the presentation. As discussed by my colleague Raquel, um, 
polypropylene used in applications uh, requiring high energy radiation uh, must be correctly stabilized to mitigate the effects of discoloration. Um, and to, to prove this, to confirm this, we performed a specific analysis in our Repsol technology lab where we analyzed yellowness index on four millimeter thick specimen. Uh, and we compared our gamma radiation uh, resistant grades to an equivalent conventionally stabilized uh, polypropylene, polypropylene subject to different levels of radiation. Um, on the left, uh, we can see a graph uh, representing results measured on our homopolymer HPP 55 RMD irradiated at 2550 and 75 kilogray compared to its equivalent version subject to the same level of radiation. And after exposure, the, we can see on the graph that the conventional polypropylene samples suf suffered much greater discoloration at all three levels of radiation compared to the HPP55 RMD. Uh, the stabilized grade maintained good aesthetics at 25 and 50 kilogray, and stronger discoloration was seen at higher doses of 75 kilogray, but still within acceptable levels. Um, the, right on the, the, the graph on the right uh, represents the equivalent results uh, based on HPR35 RMD, so the random copolymer. And equivalent results were seen in this case. Um, again, a dramatic increase in the yellowness index occurred in the standard uh, conventionally stabilized random copolymer, whereas the HPR35 RMD maintained the yellowness index within acceptable levels. And finally, on the slide, we've uh, included a picture of, uh, of uh, pipette tips and deep well plates uh, produced uh, with our HPP55 RMD and uh, the same articles uh, produced with a conventionally stabilized homopolymer. Both of these articles were irradiated at 25 kilogray, and what we can see in this picture is clearly um, on the right, so the conventionally stabilized uh, polypropylene um, clearly uh, suffered degradation phenomena, as you can see, is a lot more uh, yellow than, um, than the picture on the left. Of course, as we know, uh, degradation phenomena uh, develops with time. So in the next two slides, we will show real-time aging tests performed uh, on both materials, HPR35 RMD and HPP55 RMD. So radical reactions caused by radiation are critical because they continue to evolve uh, after the actual sterilization pro process is taking place, which is really, which is why it's important to uh, carry out um, aging tests uh, to study um, uh, the, their long-term effects. So we irradiated samples of HPP55 RMD and HPR35 RMD at 50 kilogray, and we performed real-time aging tests to confirm if the material properties remain stable with time. We analyzed uh, mechanical properties. Uh, specifically in this graph, we represented um, tensile strength and flexural modulus. Um, and um, we analyzed these, uh, these properties on both materials uh, immediately after sterilization, after 100 days, and after 200 days. Um, to see uh, whether the mechanical properties remain stable. And as you can see, for both materials, we saw that uh, there was, uh, well, the, the material properties remain stable with time, uh, confirming that in both cases, um, uh, the, the material was adequately stabilized to prevent degradation over time. And this aging study was also included evaluating discoloration of irradiated samples. So again, specifically, we analyzed the yellowness index. Um, both, uh, both in, for, in both cases, for both materials, as you can see on the graph here, um, there was no significant increase in yellowness index uh, with time. Both materials uh, ma maintained their aesthetic properties, um, confirming, again, um, with the, these uh, yellowness index results that the materials are well protected for radical reactions after sterilization process and its long-term effects. Uh, finally, we'd like to end our presentation with a brief overview of uh, regulatory compliance of our materials. Uh, of course, we're very aware uh, that biocompatibility testing is a critical part of uh, the validation process for any medical device. Um, so all our products um, included in our Repsol Healthcare brand um, 
including our HPP55 RMD and HPR35 RMD, um, are tested according, according to USP Class 6 biocompatibility. Um, this information is included in our regulatory compliance uh, reports. Here's an example on the slide on the left of the information that we include in our inner certificates. And specific biocompatibility test reports are available upon request uh, if a customer requires this information, which is uh, an, an example that we've represented here on this slide. Um, with this, we'd like to end our presentation. Uh, we'd like to thank you for your time, and uh, now we will move on to our colleague from Ionisos, who will start her presentation. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. It's my pleasure today to share with you our expertise about sterilization methods at industrial scale for sterile healthcare products. First, let me introduce Unisos Group as the leading industrial services provider in Europe. We use three technologies for sterilization, two using radiation, one using ethylene oxide as a sterilizing agent. Radiation also enables us to provide cross-linking treatments for improving plastics, like, for example, cables insulating jackets and pipes. For radiation, we can propose two technologies, gamma rays and electron beam. Yodizos operates nine facilities. Seven are radiation facilities, including three E-beam and four gamma plants, and two ethylene oxide, or EO, facilities. One additional EO facility is under construction in, in Germany. Also, our E-beam plant in Bautzen in Germany operates three machines dedicated to cross-linking of pipes and cables. The two other E-beam seats are in Chemenil in France and in Tarancon in Spain. Then we have three gamma plants in France and one in Estonia. With the market of sterilization and decontamination at a lower level of bioburden reduction, we address many products at any moment of the supply chain, as raw materials or directly finished products. Treatment of medical devices and pharmaceutical products, including also primary packaging and consumables for bioproduction, represents more than 85% of our turnover, and a volume of more than 200,000 pallets per year. To end with our introductions, I would like to outline that Dionysos measures its footprint and is highly committed for implementing sustainability at numerous levels, not only environment, but as a workplace and relationship with our customers. Now, let me introduce you the different sterilization methods recognized for their efficiency and regulated by standards. We find it chemical method with hydrogen peroxide or ethylene oxide, and radiation with three technologies that we call today modalities, and it is gamma, E-beam, and X-rays. It is reserved to products resisting to more than 130 degrees, so rarely compatible with implants or single-use medical products. Other methods are opposed to it as called sterilization method because they act with a limited increase of temperature compatible with most of materials. Among cold methods, we find ethylene oxide and radiation as technologies that can be used at industrial scale. 
Today, at the, at the industrial scale, there are three possible and different radiation modalities. First, a beam, consisting of electrons produced by an accelerator. Second, gamma rays. It consists of photons emitted by the disintegration of a sealed radioactive source of cobalt-60. And then, X-rays that are photons emitted by a metal target when hit by accelerated electrons. Here, we can start noticing that photons of gamma rays or X-rays that constitutes an electromagnetic wave, like light, have a higher penetration capacity in the matter than electrons from a beam that consists of both a charge and mass particle easier to stop by the matter. Gamma and E-beam have been proven modalities over 50 years. X-rays have been developed for the last 15 years. If their sterilizing effect is sure, facilities designs are currently being improved. Two Dionysos offers E-beam and gamma rays, and we are thinking of investing in X-rays in order to be able to offer it as an alternative to our customers in the future. The way of exposing the product to the rays is different too. As you can see on the, on the video I'm going to show you. Here is the first video about E-beam. You can see that the electrons are produced by an accelerator technology called Rodotron, and the beam is scanning the products passing under it on a horizontal conveyor. Both technologies are highly automated. Now, on this second video about gamma, you can see a robot moving a pallet from, from the storage area into a container. And the, this container with other ones are passing all around the source, like the wagons of the trains, in order to, to profit fully of uh, the rays that are emitted in all the direction from the source, all around the source. Now, I'll go on explaining you how radiation damages biomolecules. First, I would like to eliminate a possible bias. Radiation technology for sterilization is not a nuclear reaction. It involves a process called ionization that creates ions through the interaction of the incident uh, photon or incident electron with the electron orbit of the atoms from the matter. And then it's only interacting with the orbit and not the nucleus. That's why it doesn't induce any radioactivity. Radiation treatment is quantified by the energy received by the irradiated products. That is called the dose. The dose is equivalent, is expressed in gray or kilogray, and it's equivalent to an energy. So one kilogray is equivalent to an energy of one kilojoule received by one kilogram of matter. Then the dose is monitored by the exposure time itself defined by the speed of the conveyor passing in front of the source. Dose is controlled with dosimeters. So, as seen before, the penetration of electrons and photons are different, and they decrease with the thickness. If you consider a product of density 1, for example, a cube of water, electron of incident energy 10 MeV used for sterilization go through about five centimeters. And EB photons go through 50 centimeters. In real life, density of products is generally one third of it. It's about 0 0.3, 0 0.4. That explains why we are able to treat by parcel with a beam or by pallet with photons. Above all, one property of radiation dose is its cumulative property. If you deliver, for example, a standard dose of 25 kilograms, and then you treat again with 25 kilograms, 
the total effect will be 50 kilograms. So, in order to improve the penetration capacity and the dose distribution, we operate treatment on two sides of the parcel, or of the pallets. And in some gamma facilities, we can treat four sides sometimes. Then the dose distribution show a minimum point and a maximum point. Maximum point here, minimum point here. And the ratio of them is called the dual dose uniformity ratio. In order to define it, we perform some dose mapping in any product to sterilize according to the standards. Another difference between rays and especially beam and gamma rays is the dose rate. Electrons are generated in high quantity. Dose rate is, is, is of the order of hundreds of kilograms per minute. In the case of gamma rays, the dose rate is inherent to the cobalt in disintegration. The dose rate is of the order of several kilograms per, minute, per hour. Even in an, in an industrial facility with sources of several millions of curies. So, at the instant, E-beam delivers many electrons on a passing layer of parcels up to one meter wide. And gamma treats slowly many containers. But at the end of each day, each configuration leads to, the, leads to the similar outputs. The influence of the dose rate can sometimes be observed on materials. As the dose delivery is lower with gamma, the possibility of secondary reaction like small amount of, small amount of chain scission or rearrangement into insaturations or oxidation can occur in the case of materials sensitive to radiation or oxygen. That is why sometimes you can observe a yellowness of a white material with gamma and not with ebeam. But this radical chemistry is not typical or not specific of gamma. This is only the suit of the ionization process. The ion here rearranges itself into a free radical. And the free radicals can be responsible of materials modification. In real life, materials modification with radiation is typical of polymer and biopolymers, not metal or glasses or ceramics, but it's typical of synthetic or biopolymers. But half of polymers used in medical application are not impacted. And for the second half, fortunately, plastic suppliers have succeeded to overcome the radical rearrangements and develop radiation-compatible medical grades. The only material to avoid is PTFE, polytetrafluoroethylene. Here in red, you can find the plastic specialties of Revsol and you, uh, polyethylene and ethylene vinyl acetate and air polypropylene, PP, and only PP is susceptible to create concern. Then, once the materials are chosen for radiation, the pathway to the radiation sterilization process of a new material follows five milestones. First, it's necessary to go on the collect of information like the packaging and the bioburden. Packaging configuration will determine the process load for the treatment on the DUR. A routine bioburden generally does, doesn't exceed a SEL of 100, and in that case, a dose of 25 kilograms enables to reach a SEL of 10 minus 6. From the DUR combined with the minimum dose, we estimate the maximum dose. And we can check if it is lower to the maximum acceptable dose of the materials. Maximum acceptable dose is provided by the materials manufacturers, or it can be found in the AAMI guidelines TIR 17. 
The next step consists of radiation trials. On, on one trial as a maximum dose in order the manufacturer evaluates the retention of the functional properties of the products, like integrity, resistance, barrier properties, in the case of catagene, for example. And then a trial as a minimum dose, like a dose audit, in order it is needs to be done to be sure of the stability of the products. Then we can enter in the last step, that is the process of qualification as described in the standards ISO 1137, that consists of a dose mapping in the products under the same condition in that it will be treated routinely. The dose maps gives us the minimum, the maximum dose in the products, and we verify if the minimum dose, if the minimum dose is over 25 kilograms and if the maximum dose is lower than the maximum acceptable dose. And now I would like to finish my talk by answering the question, when do we choose the sterilization method? My answer is simple. The earlier you anticipate the sterilization, the higher are the chances of success. Sterilization must be considered at the beginning of the development of a new material for a medical application, or at the start of the design of a new medical device, or of a new pharmaceutical container, for example. First trials can be performed on the first product themselves, even the prototype, for example. And then the dose mapping and the packaging configuration comes later in the development cycle of a new product. And now I hope you have, I have enough clarified the process of radiation sterilization and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Lucia. Thank you, Raquel. Uh, thank you for participating today in this, uh, in this webinar. It's been a pleasure, it's been great to have you here today. Um, at Repsol, we keep working to provide solutions to the challenges of the society, and in this specific case, to the, to the challenges of the healthcare industry. We are very proud to contribute with our polyolefins uh, to people's life quality. Um, we remain at your disposal, and if you have any questions uh, in the future, feel free to contact us. Thank you again, and see you soon.